Hello. Hello. <laughs> I'm liking the uh, white face starter background and the fake light background. That's very nice. <laughs> I'll try. I'll try and move on so that it doesn't look like I've got wings coming out my head. There we go. Hi, Rosie. <laughs> I was me says hi. How are you? I'm fine. How are you? Yeah, good. 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 Oh, so we've got lots of people joining us. That's good. Just give everyone a minute to join. Looks nice and sunny where you are, Fiona. Yes, it is. Is it nice up in Scotland? It is quite nice, yeah. What's it like in Stirling, Rosie? Um, it's just a bit overcast, but it's okay. It's quite sunny here, which makes a nice change. <laughs> You had any uh, damselfly action today, Danielle? I have. I was out. I was out cleaning some blanket weed out of my water plant storage container, and there was a large red damselfly flew down, and I got a bit excited and ran over, and it flew off again. Very <laughs> <laughs> so, brief. Uh, just give everyone a couple more minutes to join, and then we'll do a quick intro um would you like people to put their questions straight to you as it's not a huge group or would you rather people did it in the chat whatever they prefer um and also if someone's asking a question you've got a great one pop it in the chat because if you're anything like me i'll forget it <laughs> um, by the time it's my turn to ask a question that's a really good point <laughs> Um, and you've got feedback forms as well, haven't you, Rosie? Yeah, so it's actually a feedback email. It used to be a link, um, but it's different. Okay. I just checked it. So shall I send it to you or you could send me the email list and I can send it out after this? Yeah, if everybody's happy um, to be contacted by us, um, then yeah, we can do that. I can send out a joint email um, and copy you into that. That's probably the yep. simplest way. <laughs> Too many options now, isn't there? <laughs> Uh, I've got greetings from Linda, from North Surrey, London border. Ah, blanket weed. I thought this might come up. <laughs> um, so I'll do a quick introduction and then we'll, we'll just go straight into it. Um, so thank you everyone for joining us. Um, this is a Pond Watch event. So Pond Watch was born last year in lockdown because uh, people couldn't get out to ponds. Um, so the idea of it is to share knowledge and for it just to be a really fun and friendly event um, to get everybody into ponds because ponds are amazing. <laughs> if you haven't got one already, um, then yeah, build one because it, it's just hours of entertainment for really not much investment. If you've got any land or anything um, or you can create a barrel pond or anything like that, I thoroughly recommend it. Um, so myself and Danielle are from the British Dragonfly Society. Um, so we obviously love ponds because we love aquatic insects <laughs> that are dragonflies <laughs> and they need ponds for the majority of their life cycle, which they spend underwater. Um, and we've got Rosie here from Frog Life, um, who obviously also a fan of ponds because <laughs> the things you look after <laughs> require fresh water as well. <laughs> um, so I don't know if you want to do a quick introduction, Rosie, um, and then Danielle, and then we can just go straight into questions after that. Yeah, of course. Brilliant. So um, um, as Fiona said, I work for a charity called Frog Life. So as you can imagine, we're an amphibian uh, charity, but so we uh, conserve amphibians, but also reptiles too. Uh, and ponds are a major, major part of that. Um, so actually, we're actually a, a nation wild wildlife charity. Um, and our kind of main concern is the conservation of the UK amphibian reptile species, but also their associated habitats as well. Um, and that kind of holistic approach with everything we do um, enables us to take lots of different people from so many different backgrounds all across the UK on a kind of wildlife journey um, whilst also delivering amazing results for our amphibian and reptile species. Um, so I specifically work on our Come Forth for Wildlife project across the Forth Valley area, so Stirling, Click Manager and Falkirk. Um, so we're a four year project, we're in I think year two, which is crazy now. It's, feels like last year didn't count. Uh, but anyway, we're in year two uh, and we're working across the Forth Valley area, as I said. Um, and yeah, so basically we do what Frog Life does um, and working with the kind of diverse different backgrounds of people who 
there across Forth Valley area, just getting them out and about in, uh, in our kind of practical conservation things that we do. Uh, so we do do the classic volunteer sessions. Uh, we also do wildlife gardening workshops with schools or community groups. Um, also, we do some lovely, um, a thing called mapistry, which is really cool. So it's uh, making this massive tapestry uh, that's like a gigantic community collaborative art piece. Uh, so people make like um, little frogs or something like that out of recycled fabric and then our artist pulls it all together. She's obviously honestly amazing at her job and makes it into this uh, fantastic tapestry piece that will be touring. Um, and then also things like this, so our pond doctor event. So yeah, basically if you have any questions about a pond you have or you want to have or anything at all, um, you can ask away. So that's basically it in a very kind of slightly large nutshell actually. <laughs> that's brilliant. <laughs> Thank you. And um, Danielle, do you want to do a quick introduction to uh, to what the BDS do in, up in Scotland? Yeah, well, yes, I'm, I'm the Scottish Conservation Officer and I work on our hotspots and we have um, 10 hotspots across Scotland, which are fantastic places, obviously, for seeing dragonflies, but they're also great places for um, engaging people in conservation work. We quite often have conservation tasks in the, in the autumn and um, carrying out training and running guided walks and so on. So for people to learn uh, about ponds, because they've always got ponds, and about dragonflies. And there's how many other um, hotspots in the rest of the UK? Another four? Uh, yeah, we, we've got four, but we're going to designate uh, three more this summer and then a few more next year as well. So we'll, we'll catch up with you in Scotland. <laughs> <laughs> so they're expanding across, across the whole of the UK. And I also work um, with rare species and work with landowners who have rare species to, to manage their sites for um, for those rare species, such as you know the really exciting ones that, that are at the top of the dragonfly twitchers tick list, like the azure hawker and the, the northern damselfly and the northern emerald. Excellent. Um, so we've got two very knowledgeable pond doctors today. Um, so yeah, I think we've got a question in the chat. We've had one so the first one was about blanket weed um, and then we had one from Barbara which was how long do we need to wait before putting goldfish in a new pond and uh, does rainwater need time to settle and do plants need to grow for a while in the water before the fish go in so it's a, a fish related question. Okay do we want to take it in turns Rosie? Yeah do you want to go first or shall I? You can go first. <laughs> Cool. So I would say we're slightly biased at frog life. Normally we wouldn't encourage um, fish if you also want um, aquatic amphibians as well, because often they just tend to um, munch upon all your tadpoles and things like that. Um, very happy fish, not very happy frogs or whatever. Um, but I suppose if you're wanting to, so I can't see the questions. Uh, so I think they're just private to you, Fiona. Um, but I think it might be a setting. Um, but yeah, I think the question was, do you have to wait a while before you put uh, goldfish in? Um, so I suppose it would be the same with any kind of animal. Uh, goldfish are pretty resilient anyway. Um, so I would say as long as you've got, for fish, you want oxygenated water. So some sort of water that's nice and fresh and then some um, aquatic plants, I suppose. Um, and that kind of thing for goldfish and somewhere for them to shelter as well. Um, Cause they got often get munched upon by uh, herons as well. And for rainwater, um, that's fine to fill your ponds up um, for any uh, amphibians. Um, if you're filling your pond, so if you've already got stuff in your pond, so whether it be insects, amphibians, fish, whatever, if you are then taking um, fresh water from your house, your tap water or an outdoor hose, you want to leave it in a bucket for at least 24 hours, ideally a lot longer for all the kind of nasties to get out. So things like chlorine and stuff like that um, before you then put it in your pond. Um, Cause particularly our amphibians are very, very sensitive to to any kind of things in the water and um, but yeah I think that answers all the questions. I, I would just add um, my brother did have some goldfish in his raised his raised pond um, and I think during a recent hard winter they were frozen in the frozen in the ice and all perished so just like you would with a wildlife pond you'd, you'd like your wildlife pond to be a minimum of a meter deep at the deepest the deepest bit and that's unlikely to freeze in a hard winter so they that acts as a bit of a refuge during during a time of, of cold 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 weather and i think the feet the fish would probably appreciate that as well okay we've got 
a couple more questions. Um, so we've got that first one about blanket weed, and then there's another one about the green frothy mush, uh, mush in the pond. Looks similar to blanket weed, but breaks up easily, so it's harder to remove. Um, yeah. So I'm guessing that could be algae of some sort. Um, yeah. so if we want to sort of just just a bit of advice, I think, on how to deal with with blanket weed and algae, I guess, for those questions. Well, I was actually just trying to, to remove some of the, the blanket weed from my um, water storage container. So I run a, a small native wildflowers nursery as well, and I store quite a lot of my water plants in these containers, but they, they have attracted wildlife. And um, so I, I have to manage them for wildlife as well. And the one just outside the door and um, that gets a lot of sun and I, I think it quite often um, blanket weeds related to the amount of sun that that you get on your pond so this one does get quite a lot of blanket weeds so it, it's a case of a little and often when it comes to to management so I, I get a bamboo cane and basically just twirl twirl it in the twirl it in the water and try and get as much of the blanket weed out as I can at a time and then I'll put it in a in a bucket of water because there is quite a lot of wildlife living in amongst that blanket weed. There'll be things in there feeding, and then give it give it time, give the wildlife time to sort of escape from the blanket weed and into the water. And then I can put the water back in and compost the the blanket weed. Um, I think one of the things to 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 plan for with your pond is to try and have maybe fifty percent open water and fifty percent covered by by vegetation. So whether that's water lilies or um, uh, pond weeds are also another good one um, and try and get them to cover up a fair bit of the surface so that the, the sunlight isn't getting all the way down to the, the bottom on the whole of the pond and have lots of oxygenators as well so they're putting plenty of oxygen into the into the water so hornworts and water starworts and so on water milfoil that kind of thing. You got anything to add Rosie? Um, yeah, so we've got a um, Just Add Water Planting Guide. It's all about ponds, basically, um, which I can uh, link you all in the email afterwards. Um, so it's totally free. It just gives you some other uh, plants, so such as Danielle mentioned. Um, I'm thinking about marginal planting as well, just in case there is any runoff causing the algae kind of mushness. Uh, one thing we do add as well is barley straw, but it's only really relevant if it is algae, if it's might just be an overgrown plant. Yeah, and when, if, if you have those big sort of clumps of algae, um, I would use a, a net to try and remove them and then again put them in some water to see if there's anything living in there and, and, and try and rescue them and put them back. I think I've just found the Just Add Water page on your website, so I've just popped yep. it in the chat, so hopefully everyone can see that link. Um, but yeah, we've, we've got a few guides um, of digging a pond and managing ponds throughout the year as well. But yeah, as you both said, it's just sort of little and often really, isn't it? Trying to keep on top of it and trying to establish some kind of symbiosis with everything when it all settles down as well. <laughs> and it, yeah, as soon as the sun comes out, I, I always get blanket weed, algae, duckweed, kind of deadly three combination. <laughs> and it's just, it is like just frothy weird stuff isn't it <laughs> um we had a couple more questions um there was one about where's it gone uh somebody said oh this is gareth uh said i've heard newts and frogs don't coexist well um perhaps the newts eat the spawn is this correct we have a small pond about six foot by three foot that sounds quite a good size to me <laughs> um, would ideally like to get both species so any advice for newts and frogs coexisting? Yeah. So similar to Gareth, I always thought it was the newts that ate the frogs, uh, but we got submitted some photos over the week to our Frog Life social media team of this big frog munching. It was a marsh frog down some south munching on this big uh, newt. So I think they both uh, try and get each other. Um, so yeah, I think any amphibians, to be honest, they all just eat each other. They're a bit... Um, a bit bad sometimes um so yeah i think often i mean it sounds like you've got a big enough pond to have both um so i've certainly seen ponds with both uh um, like newts and frogs and stuff like that in um so frogs are a little bit so amphibians um so newts are, sorry, not amphibians, newts, uh, they actually can sense uh, chemical indicators in the air of where water is, which is 
so clever I don't actually know how they do it um I probably should learn because I work for Frog Life but anyway uh, so they can do that which is absolutely amazing so if you put build a pond often they will be able to find it uh, whereas frogs are a little bit trickier because often they will go majority of the time they return back to their their original pond where they were kind of hatched and um uh, were tadpoles and they will go back there to breed um, so often you will get returning frogs unless they were tadpoles in that pond um, but you will get frogs throughout the year because often they'll be born in one pond and then go off and um, so they might come to your pond to spend summer and then go back um, in the spring to to breed in their original pond so you can have both um, and I would just say, you know, make sure you've got enough vegetation. So they do have some sort of cover, both of them, maybe from each other. Um, and then, yeah, I think that's everything. Yeah, I think. And then thinking about it as well around your pond. So maybe um, think about putting a hibernacula in, which is like basically a, a pile of logs, uh, a log pile that they could hide in and forage in. And um, maybe increasing your wildflowers around the area as well. So somewhere, yes, you've got your lovely pond, but you could also maybe do a little bit of tweaking around it to give both a uh, kind of foraging, but also shelter habitats too. Um, there was a, a follow up to that that I've just seen and it, um, I think Gareth wanted to know, um, is there anything that they can do to encourage the frogs um, as they've already got the newt? So I think that was kind of more, maybe more towards the frog side of it they wanted to know about. Um, so I would just say put, be putting in, um, so if you've already got your pond, great. And then, so things like, yeah, the hibernacula, maybe um, some wildfires obviously depends where your garden is like my garden is all walled in um so they can't really get in <laughs> so um but some gardens you know have um like fences and stuff like that maybe a local woodland so you could speak to your neighbors as well and almost create like a wildlife corridor uh, but i suppose i would just try like a few things um and they're all free as well you know everyone's got piles of logs somewhere you could put them in make it really nice um and then you could see if that helps and then you could do something else that kind of thing is all a, a little bit trial and error uh, unfortunately with the, the frogs <laughs> i suppose it's a bit like in hedgehog street where people are asking people to um to cut um a small a, a hedgehog sized space in their fence aren't they so that hedgehogs can move from one one garden to another um that could that could work for frogs Fro well frogs and all sorts of a, a small wildlife as well um, if you've got a completely sort of walled in garden just to have a small gap for things to move through. Sounds like good advice. Um, so we had another question about dragonflies. Where's this one gone? Um, so Jonah said, every year I've had good dragonfly populations, but what not one dragonfly seen this year. Um, my pond doesn't seem any different. Any ideas on that? Where where are you, Jonah? Are you are you northern or southern? I'm South Wales. Right. Um, what's your when how What's your weather been like? Have you had quite cold conditions like we have? A, a slow, a very slow spring? Yeah, it was. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> but ordinarily, yeah. I, I have all sorts here. I mean, really good populations of different types. Uh -huh. I haven't seen a single one. I've got um, damselflies. Right. Well, that's that's I've got that's a good. Single dragonfly. Right. Um. I can't, I can't, I would have thought you'd have seen a few by now. Um, Fiona's probably early. still quite early. Yeah, as I said, I've not seen any dragonflies near me yet. Um, I'm in Lincolnshire on the, on the opposite side of the country. Um, well, I, um, I keep a diary and every year I get broad bodied chasers in May. Right. I mean, the beginning of May sort of thing. All right. Uh, and that's from your pond? Yeah. I don't know. I suppose it, it, it could well just be the, the, the colder spring and the slow summer that we've had to, to start. Um, but you say there's nothing's changed with your pond. There's not been a change in vegetation no. or change no, in land. Not that I would notice. I mean, you know, it's, it's a pond that's been there for seven years now. It's a big yeah. pond. Well, medium. Um, so I would just say fingers crossed that they appear soon. Okay, fine. <laughs> 
I was going to say broad body chasers are, are quite known for liking new ponds as well. So I, I do wonder as ponds kind of go through succession a bit, so it's about seven years old, um, if it's, it's you know, there might be a subtle difference that they're noticing that, that right. yeah. maybe make, make some muddy edges or something for them. <laughs> Right, yes. Well, I've had broad body chasers for the past five years, certainly. Yeah, it could, yeah, it could just be a bit late. It's been a, a weird old spring. Yeah, yeah. Well, thanks. It's okay. Um, I'm just going to see if anyone, has anyone got any more questions? Uh, we covered that one. Well, I, I had a question about my bond. Um, I've got a lot of duckweed. <laughs> Do we have any any ideas on how to uh, stop duckweed taking over? So I've got a water lily, um, and that's just popping up a couple of leaves. Uh, my my pond's only a year old. Um, is it just because it's a new pond? Um, I had to use tap water to fill it, um, but obviously that's like you know a year ago, and I've not topped it up with anything other than rainwater since. Um, any ideas on, on how to get on top of duckweed? Or should I just wait? <laughs> uh, well, I would, um, I mean, you've probably still got quite a high nutrient load in there, which you can help reduce just by more planting. Again, make sure you've got oxygenators in there. And I think it's just a case of scooping off the, the duckweed with a, a net um, every so often so, so it doesn't get too you know, so it doesn't take over. Um, it's just one. It's just one of those things that most ponds have. So you just got to keep. You just got to keep on top of it. <laughs> Any advice from you, Rosie, on duckweed? No, it's annoying as well because you've <laughs> made a new pond <laughs> that has already <laughs> appeared. Yeah, with high nutrients. So yeah, just basically what Daniel said. Um, we had it in. Um, my old office the charity I used to work for it was full of our pond was full of duckweed and I never got around to it but someone suggested experimenting with a, a hula hoop or a circle like a floating disc to create like clear areas yeah. Um, but yeah so you could try it. I never got around to it but you could try <laughs> that and see let us know how you get on yeah I might give it a go yeah because the annoying thing with it is that it does just tend to kind of go across the middle <laughs> or, and then it just spreads out again so like try and take little bits out and then it, it's just back mm -hmm. the day <laughs> yeah and I would add as well if anyone is taking anything out of your pond uh of their ponds just leave it on the side and let the things crawl back in or pop it in some water and see what kind of crawls out just because there's so much um you know snails tiny little things tiny insects particularly um and maybe some eggs as well so it's good just to let everything crawl out and um, if if it can and then obviously you can just pop it on your compost then yeah that's really good advice actually um because yeah it's easy to get carried away isn't it when you're sort of clearing stuff out but yeah i found loads of uh damselfly larvae when i was removing leaves oh, my pond last year and they, they're just sort of stuck to the bottom of the leaf they sort of almost get like stuck in the water film on things and I was like oh no <laughs> and taking the, the things I want in there out so yeah I kind of stopped taking leaves out for a bit after that <laughs> or just really carefully wash them out uh, I think I've seen a question from Linda um so she said ponds in the sunshine I'm worried that if I put a new pond in a sunny spot it's going to dry out quickly is is that an issue what I would suggest is, um, yeah, you're likely to, to have some evaporation. Um, like we said before, see if you can have 50% of your of your pond has some kind of uh, vegetation over it, over it. So water lily pads, for example. But if you make it deep enough, say, it depends on the size of your garden, how much space you have. But if you make a deeper pond, then obviously that's less likely to um to to dry out than a than a shallower pond so you could maybe try one and a half meters in the deepest bit and then that's very unlikely to to dry out so you may have sort of the edges of it um sort of the the, the height of the the water will sort of go down over the summer um and you might want to top it up a little bit if you can collect some water from your from your rain butts from your water butts and um, don't use don't use tap water but um 
the chances are that you're gonna still contain you're gonna still have some water at the bottom if you've got quite a deep pond mm -hmm. it's a bit trickier if you've already got your <laughs> already got your pond and it's relatively shallow i would suggest just keep topping that up um with water from from rainwater basically rather than tap water Excellent. Anything to add to that, Raisy, from an amphibian's point of view? Yeah, I mean, shallow, If yeah, so if you've got vegetation in, um, if it kind of dries up, it's not the worst thing in the world. Um, you know, most amphibians still would like it. So just make sure, as uh, Danielle said, have enough vegetation in there and maybe some habitats just outside the pond. So maybe like a little hibernacula log pile just next to the pond or something like that. Um, and then, yeah, when make it deeper until it's like autumn time, late autumn when it's inactive. And then you could either make it deeper. And if you are making it deeper, just do make sure all your edges going in are nice and um, shallow and no no cliffs because the little particularly little froglets they can never get out even if it's like two inches uh, they just can never make it which is so sad um, so yeah just make sure all the pond edges are really nice and sloping and um, quite gently um, or if you're like I just want to leave that if you've got space you could make a slightly deeper pond nearby uh, there's nothing wrong with like having multiple ponds in a similar area it's quite nice actually um, so yeah I think you know as long as it's not bone dry it's okay if it's a little bit uh, dries up in summer and um, you know it's, it's actually okay for amphibians not so much if you've got fish in there obviously not that great uh, but for amphibians they're pretty resilient. Cool um did uh, was it Brian did you have a question I think someone had their hand up. Yes I did um if I can introduce myself my name is Brian Huggins. I live just um, outside Bath um, in a small village. We have a, a village green space, which is managed by the parish council. And in there, we have a stream, a uh, number of streams. Uh, and we also have a pond, which is probably uh, with the marsh area, about 120 feet by 30 feet. So it's a fairly substantial pond. And we're very anxious to get as much wildlife in there as we possibly can. We do see uh, the occasional um, uh, dragonfly uh, and uh, you know, a few frogs as well, but not as much as I feel we should have. My query is, you know, you're talking about vegetation. Have we got too much vegetation? Can you ever have too much vegetation? Because we've got reeds, we've got uh, irises, uh, we've got a number of other wild plants growing in there. But one thing that seems to grow extremely well is um, fool's cress, which at the present moment is taking over nearly 50% of the pond water area. Would you advise us to get that out and sort of reveal more water, or would you advise us just to leave it alone? A fool, I don't know what fool's crest is. Um, do you know its scientific name? Oh, I wish I did. It is, it is just crest. I've just Does Googled that... it. Oh, like it's a crest. it's um, fool's water crest, which is um, Appium nodiflorum. If you say so. <laughs> According to Google, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. um, I, don't, I don't know that. Is that a non-native? Do, do you have any idea, Fiona? Um, I don't think it is, because um, watercress has been grown traditionally for eating, hasn't it? Um, but yeah, the fool's watercress, I'm, I'm not that familiar with that plant, to be honest. Um, but yeah, it, if it is sort of taking over, I'm wondering if it, if, you know, someone has planted it or it's come from a garden or something. Yeah. It sounds like it could do with a little bit of management, maybe, if, it, if it's getting a bit invasive. It is very invasive. Yeah, uh, well, we do actually have it throughout the site. Uh, we we have um, the site itself is is very old, um, and at one time there were crest beds as such right. uh, in in the in the area. Um, but this is not watercress. This is definitely a, a sort of um, variant of that, mm. and uh, you know it grows. The 
um, stems of it are anything up to about well, 14, 15 feet and very, very thick indeed. Oh, that, sounds, that does sound like quite a monster. It is. Well, I think if you've got if you've got a monster taking over your pond, I think come this autumn, um, which is really the best time to, to do pond management tasks, I think um, you might be advised to, to try and clear quite a lot of that out. Right. Okay. Um, a tool that I found really useful, and I'm sure you have as well, Rosie. It's um, it's basically a sort of a long a long fork with the the fork shaped like that, so the tines shaped like that, and that's absolutely brilliant for um, removing vegetation from from ponds. Um, again, like we said earlier on, if you can rinse off that, rinse off the vegetation before composting it, or leave it by the side of the pond so that the, there's bound to be like we we beasties on it, and um, let them let them crawl out. Um, but yes, it certainly does does sound like you need to do a bit of work. I mean, you could send send us some photos, and we could have a we could have a closer look. I'll do that. It is. I've just looked up. It is a native one, um, so it's not a non-native. Um, yeah, it is native. Yeah. Yeah, as I say, it's maybe just sort of taken over a bit if it it likes its surroundings, and maybe there's a lot of nutrients, and it's it's just gone mad. Okay. Thank you very much. <clears throat> And as well, it sounds, what was the size? 120 foot by? 120 by about 30. Wow, that's amazing. Um, so with that, it will be a massive, massive job to keep on top of all of that vegetation consistently. And um, so what you could do is organize like a village clear out this autumn to, you know, really get on top of it. And then from there, just try and manage like open like, little pools of water, like throughout it would be quite nice. Um, and then that's going to allow much more dragonflies and other beautiful, lovely um, insects. And then also hopefully encourage some amphibians as well um, to, I think we've done that very different site but in Falkirk um, it's full of uh, flag yellow iris this big area and rushes and stuff like that so we've created some quite deep um, scrapes of about zero uh, not 0 0.2 that's very small 1.2 meters deep and um, you know quite quite small deeper areas uh, you could hand dig them as well to create these lovely open uh, bodies of water and we've already got some newts in there as well got some palmate newts so that's another way to do it and then it's a lot easier because then you then next autumn uh, 2020 uh, to autumn you can then just manage those areas and maybe put some more um lovely different aquatic plants in that kind of thing as well and um, it might be a wee bit easier longer term thank you Yeah, if there's anything else um, we can do to help on that, feel free to email us afterwards um, and we, we can ask our conservation team if they've got any ideas as they might have experience of managing sort of similar habitats or just you know getting on top of any problem species. So we might be able to give you some more detailed advice via email after. Uh, I've seen a few more questions come in. Um, so we've done the sunshine one. Uh, do you recommend adding Daphnia to a wildlife pond to help clear algae? And is barley uh, is barley straw extract effective? Presumably the newts will feast on them. I think I mean the the Daphnia. Maybe they'll feast on them. I've never I've never used barley straw extract. Is that the stuff that comes in a you can you can buy it basically like a liquid? Yeah. I I've just used barley straw itself in a sort of mesh in the past and and, and it does work um so i don't know I, I i can't answer that question about the barley straw have you the extract have you used the extract rosie oh so we've just got a big bale in our office and then we'll just make up little bundles and chuck them yeah. in um mm. so yeah and that's sometimes a cheaper way to do it is buy a big bale um you just need to make sure it doesn't get wet if you're storing it or eaten by mice um yeah. Or nested, nested in by mice. Yeah, I know. It'll encourage more wildlife, uh, probably not where you want it. Um, but no, I've not used Daphnia and I've not used the, the extract. Um, so I don't actually know. I don't know. Have you used Daphnia? No, I haven't. Um, though one of my, um, I mean, I, I suppose something that, that people have to be quite, ner quite wary of is transplanting if they're moving things from one pond to another maybe you know the possibility of bringing disease from one one pond to another um if 
if it's coming in with some vegetation, for example. And Rosie, you'd be able to tell us a bit more about the awful the the virus that frogs have been getting. Yeah. Um, but certainly, um, I have a burn running through the bottom of the my field, and um, quite a lot of life in that. And I just took a bit of water from there. Um, and put it into my bath where I, where I store some plants. Um, and so there's some Daphne I came in with that. And certainly that, the bath was was pretty clear um, for most of last year. It was a fantastic, actually it was fantastic. I had heaps of large red damselflies emerging and uh, uh, onto the um, um, emergent vegetation from the bath. So maybe that, maybe that did help. I did have barley straw in there as well, but it was a, lo it was a lovely habitat last year. Presuming this is an outside bath. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's not one that I actually use <laughs> for myself. <laughs> yeah, I think that's quite an important point about the invasive non-natives, because I, I used to work for Rivers Trusts and you know we we think about it a lot in habitats like that, but it yeah, it's just as important in ponds, isn't it? You could easily be moving stuff around and I guess it, it's probably even more problematic in a pond because it's you know a finite space and and those species can't escape or or move anywhere else. Yeah, I think I think you have to be quite careful as well if you're wanting to get plants from a garden centre because when my when my mom and dad put their pond in, so this is going back over twenty years, but I think they got quite a lot of their their plants from a garden centre and they ended up with the pond being absolutely choked with New Zealand pygmy weed and that is. Probably the number one plant you really don't want in your pond. I'm sure they got it from a from a, from a plant nursery, and they've also got lots of monkey flower as well, which um, again that's that's non-native, and yeah. So it's I think plant nurseries are better than they used to be in that they, they hopefully they won't st stock the real nasties, but they do still stock non-natives. Um, they're far better sticking with you know native plants. They're going to do better in in our climate, um, and they'll be far better for for our wildlife as well. Yeah, and I guess there's some really good um, kind of suppliers now, isn't there? Than there probably were over twenty years ago. I know I've found a few online over the last year just because of lockdown and not being able to go to local garden centres. So yeah, there seems to be seems to be a lot more readily available now, which is good, like native pond uh, packs, which are really handy. Definitely. Um, I don't think, has anyone got any more questions? Anyone want to just ask one? I can't see any more. I don't think I've missed any in the chat. I'm just gonna have a quick look through, make sure I've not missed any. I'd quite like to ask Rosie a question about, about our amphibians. I have seen three frogs this year. You know, normally I would I would have lots of them breeding in the burn. Um, and I'd see I'd see them in in the nursery, I'd see them in my, my, the various water bodies, but I've seen three three frogs. None of them have been breeding in the in the burn. Obviously, we've had a very cold, cold winter, we've had a, a slow spring. Um, how how are how are yours faring in the Fourth Valley? Yeah, I don't actually think I've seen a I've seen one frog this year, <laughs> so really? yeah, not so good. Um, yeah, it's really tricky and it's hard to know what's caused it. Like, uh, you know, there's lots of different threats. Um, I think this year we had that really cold bit, but it was quite warm earlier. So obviously, mm -hmm. you know, a lot of animals in general will work off seasonal cues. So you know, they might have either emerged too early and then been killed off, or maybe they've laid their eggs and they've not survived the frost. Um, another thing as well that um, our frogs and toads actually can do, which is so clever, is they can stay as a tadpole till next year. So potentially, and I, I don't know if this has happened, but um, I've, I've seen it before, you know, around this time or maybe a wee bit earlier, and the frog, uh, tadpoles are just hatching, you'll see some gigantic tadpoles. And that's actually last year's one. So for whatever reason, maybe they um, hatched too late or maybe the, the seasons were, weren't quite perfect for them. They can stay as a tadpole till next year and then become a frog. So maybe that's what's happened as well. 
um, which I just think is amazing that they can choose to do that. Um, but yeah, um, so that's probably, it, it is probably to do with the weather more than anything else. Um, yeah, unfortunately. And then another thing about, which is related to climate is like, just from Twitter, so asking people to, to let us know when they see their first dragonflies and damselflies and so on, quite a lot of people here, here in Scotland, we're, we always thought that damselflies had a, a two year life cycle we, we we thought that damselflies would um, take two years to, to get to the stage where they can emerge. But I have had quite a few people posting pictures of their large red damselflies emerging from their ponds that were put in last last year. Um, mm -hmm. And I know Fiona, you've had you've had damselflies emerging this year. And you know yeah. that bit further south, so that's what we that's what we expect. But um, yeah, my pond's only a year old. Um, but what I think might have happened because my friend gave me some water mint, um, so I I think something maybe came in from his pond. Um, but I had I did see damselflies around my garden, not many, um, but they could have snuck in. You know, when I wasn't there on a, a hot day last year, and I saw Emperor laying her eggs in there. Um, I, I think we are seeing kind of a one year cycle for some of them because the, the water temperature in smaller garden ponds rather than sort of bigger water bodies out in the countryside. And we may be having microclimates as well in cities because they're acting as heat islands. So, yeah, it, it could be changing their life cycles a bit, I guess. Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? Um, yeah, we did, we've just had a question about that, actually. Um, I think it was Gareth wanted to know uh, how long does it take for dragonfly nymphs to reach adult maturity to hatch? So that, that leads on quite nicely. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> one to two years, we would say. Uh, it just depends. It just depends where you are. Norm here, here in Scotland, we would normally say two years. Um, south of England, we would normally say one. In the south of France, for example, there could be um, there could be two generations in, in one summer, or maybe even three generations in one summer. So it, 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 a lot of it's dependent on uh, on temperature. But as, as temperatures are rising, it, it, I mean, that's probably going to have quite an impact. And it's already having quite an impact on our dragonflies and on our amphibians as well. Yeah, that's, it's cool that they can delay hatching as well or you know becoming an adult we've, we've not heard of that so much in dragonflies have we it, tend, it tends to the other way <laughs> they're kind of you know just really going for it because of the warmer temperature um, I, I do think um there is a a fact that i always like to tell children at events that uh golden ring dragonfly larvae uh, especially sort of up up north in Scotland might take up to seven years, I think is the one of the, the records that we've been told about um, for the length of time. So yeah, I guess they are, they're very temperature dependent, aren't they? And the yeah. larger species will take longer to mature or you know, they, they won't be able to find as much food if it's cooler, so they'll try and save energy. Yeah, definitely. So I suppose, yeah, golden ring dragonflies that are in upland burns, for example, it's, they're going to be cold um and there's not that much food available so so yes it takes them quite a long time to to develop and and be ready to emerge i can't wait to see my first golden ring dragonfly oh <laughs> should be, should be too far off need to get out into the hills yeah fingers crossed <laughs> Uh, well, my, my tadpoles, um, going back to them staying as tadpoles, some of mine have got legs and some haven't, and they're like, they're right. slightly different stages. So I was kind of thinking, oh, I wonder if any of them will change into froglets this year. But yeah, some of them have got legs now, so they look like teeny aliens. They're so cool. <laughs> I was going to ask a quick question. I've, I've got a very quick question about tadpoles. Um, when I was in Northumberland a few years ago, uh, it was Bamborough Beach. There was kind of a little pool of water at the top in a, a rock, uh, just sort of down from the dunes. And there were loads of tadpoles in it, but it, it was kind of right near to rock pools. So I didn't know if, if salty water would get in there at high tide. Mm. And I just wondered how common it is to see tadpoles in sort of on a, a coastal areas. So I've, I've never seen it myself before. So I was quite surprised. And it wasn't a natural jack toad. 
I don't know what they were. They were um, just tadpoles. They just, I, I didn't, I couldn't tell sort of what species they were. I'm not, not that great on tadpole ID. <laughs> no, it's quite hard. It's <laughs> like little, little black tadpoles to me. <laughs> yeah, so the Nasha Jack obviously is, is um, native to kind of like more kind of like sandy areas. They're south of Scotland and then into the kind of coastal areas of England as well. Um, so that's a potential. But yeah, because I think salty water, even though the Nash Jacks love the sand, I'm pretty sure they don't like salty water. It's still fresh water. Um, so yeah, it probably wouldn't be that good. But I've seen tadpoles up like weird places, like up Ben Louis in Scotland, which is a really hard, ginormous climb uphill. <laughs> and then there was a little pond at the top of tadpoles. So I, was, I have no idea how a frog got up there uh, so exposed as well so yeah they often go in like really weird places oh, that's cool I have to keep an eye out for them if I go up there again and <laughs> see if they're still there I did wonder if some fresh water was kind of coming down and making a little puddle because it, it, it was a little bit higher up than the rest of the beach so yeah or rainwater yeah yeah it could have been a rainwater pool I guess but yeah it was just really bizarre there was like Bamber Castle in the background and then just this tiny little kind of puddle in the rocks well quite a big puddle um with loads of tadpoles in I was just like I've never seen tadpoles at the beach before <laughs> it was bizarre <laughs> uh cool um well if nobody's got any other questions um I said, yeah, somebody just said about the how long does it take for dragonfly larvae to reach maturity that they haven't had any yet, uh, but their pond's only been there for about 18 months. Um, so, yeah, I guess it's just a matter of time till they find your pond, hopefully. I don't, I don't know. I don't know what we can advise for <laughs> attracting them, putting, putting little signs out. <laughs> oh, they're, yeah. they're quite good at finding, new, finding ponds, aren't they? So I'm sure... I'm sure something will arrive at some point soon if they haven't already. I suppose, and it also depends what what's round about you. So if you're if you're in the middle of some sort of industrial agricultural area where nothing can nothing can survive because of the spraying, then obviously it's going to be a lot trickier for for wildlife to find you than if you're if you're in amongst a you know a, a more wildlife rich area. So it does depend to certain to a certain extent what 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 is close by. Yeah, definitely. And, and um, dragonflies can see a polarised light as well. So, you know, if they're flying around the area looking for somewhere, you know, they'll they'll spot your water and they'll come down to it. So, yeah, hopefully it's just a matter of time. Uh, well, I can't see any more questions. Um, if anyone has got any more, just shout out quickly. Um, otherwise, I think we'll wrap it up there as we're, we're about on time. Um, Oh, God, thank you for all the information from Steve. Oh, thank you for joining us. <laughs> um, so, yeah, I'll just say a big thank you to Rosie from Frog Life. Um, and if everybody is OK with us emailing you uh, just for a bit of feedback afterwards, um, we have got a feedback form um, from Frog Life um, so that will help them with their Pond Doctor um, project. Um, and yeah, I think that's it from us. So thank you, Danielle, for your time, for our, our own uh, Dragonfly Pond Doctor, <laughs> and to Rosie from Frog Life. Um, yeah, and thank you all for joining us on this lovely sunny afternoon when we could all be outside. <laughs> um, yeah, enjoy the rest of your weekend, and we will pop this on YouTube. Um, so if you missed any of the answers or came in late, um, we'll pop it all on there um, on our channel, and you'll be able to watch it back. Um, so yeah, thank you very much. Thanks for your time, all of you. Bye. Cheers. Bye. Bye. Bye.